Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph about appropriate technology, practical philosophy, and lots of other, well, good and basic things. Yes, very fundamental stuff. Yes. Uh, also connected to the YouTube channel and the videos, obviously, so uh, if you're interested in our other social media information, you can, of course, find that in the description. Um, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, there is, of course, um, our um, Audible link, audibletrial.com slash goodandbasic, or um, you can also donate directly to us at anchor.fm. Um, if so, we sure appreciate it. Okay, Thank you. let's uh, jump right in. Today we're going to cover an extremely f- <laughs> powerful idea. Occasionally you run into those ideas that just start infecting everywhere, mm-hmm. and, and you can use it to interpret lots of things, and it's not only something you can use to interpret lots of things, some of those ideas end uh-huh. up being non-falsifiable and useless, uh-huh. but this one is amazingly practical, mm-hmm. and it's called the OODA loop. Yes. Um, thank you, by the way. And actually, I think that's a that's a great place to bring this up. So uh, when I first pitched this to you, right, because sometimes we'll pitch video ideas to each other, right? I was like, hey, Joseph, you know, like, I think we ought to do a week on writing. I think I want to write some videos about writing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was talking to other shows. <laughs> it's ambiguous, right? Um, yeah, I was like, okay, well, like, what if we did a week on writing, right? And I, I almost feel like the, the idea, you know, because a lot of the videos we do on this channel, some are more philosophic, but a lot of them are, like... When you think of our channel, you think of iron smelts, right? You think of Roman shields. You think of stuff like that, right? You don't yeah. think of writing exactly. Nope. So, so, so I almost do feel like the idea like needs some justification, which I think I'm very happy to supply. But, but it does sort fact, of need that justification, don't you think? Despite the fact that on Hadrian's Wall, your conclusion after that video was the pen is mightier than the sword. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is true. Which. Gosh, when I was editing that video, I cringed so hard. It's the worst joke in the world. And like, Lloyd was just totally flabbergasted, I think. Like, yep. did he really? Ju- anyway, okay. Uh, yeah. The, the roots are there. The roots yeah. are there. This is something that is, uh, writing is one of those fundamental, extremely mm-hmm. uh, simple technologies that mm-hmm. influences the way that the world is constructed. It, it, it has literally changed human memory. Yeah. So in non-written cultures, uh, people hold books in their heads. And they mm-hmm. memorize them in the form of poetry. Beowulf is an example of this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm told that in a traditional Islamic education that you memorize the Quran by the time you're 10. Mm-hmm. And so there's this audio, more oral audio-based cultures mm-hmm. end up having stronger memories yeah. than cultures that use the written word. Because the written word effectively is a way to outsource remembering things. Yeah. But it's also an incredibly powerful way of ex thinking using not only your brain but also mm-hmm. your hands yes and and going through the iterative process and seeing what you thought in a very precise way yeah and and this i think is to, to me this is the whole point of the writing series is that like when you think of writing and reading and speaking you think of it as an art you think of it as the humanities you think of it as something that is done for beauty and embellishment and if you have the gift you do and if you don't have the gift well there's always the stem fields yeah and and my answer is well, well no no i don't think i think the right way to look at writing i mean i think it is i think it writing and speaking certainly can be beautiful and arts and so on and so forth certainly humanity so on and so forth great right um, but i look at it and i'm like uh, uh, it might occur to you that this is the one of the things that separates us from animals Right, like it might occur to you that maybe part of the reason why we sent people to the moon is because we have language, right? Like that's at least a possibility, right? Um, it's something that and not just spoken apart. language, but written language. Yeah, uh, written language has a couple of advantages. One, it, it helps mm-hmm. you to remember things outside of yeah. your head, which means you can work with vastly more complicated problems. Mm-hmm. Um, doing math on paper is so much better than doing it in your head, despite. <sighs> <laughs> um, how annoyed you got when people asked you to show your work. Mm-hmm. But another thing it allows you to do is to uh, communicate with people across time. Mm-hmm. And so you can work in an asynchronous way in multiple mm-hmm. locations at multiple times. You can have conversations with people who've been dead for a thousand years mm-hmm. using the written word. Yeah. And so being able to communicate with someone who's not there in the room able to hear you is a big deal. Yeah. So that way you can have space centers in multiple places in Texas and Florida and all over the place and coordinate the entire Mm -hmm. project of putting someone on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, try, not only try sending someone to the moon without language, right? But, like, try something much more basic. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example, right? Like, try try manufacturing a car. Try designing and manufacturing a car without language, right? Uh, Not that easy. And specifically written language. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and specifically written language. Well, and, you know, it's it's worth mentioning, parenthetically, I think we'll wind back to this at some point, but it's worth mentioning that we live in a really interesting time in the history of the world because um, the the written word, right, particularly with the invention and dissemination of the printing press, insanely powerful, right? 
The written word has been insanely powerful, the, for, insanely powerful for the last 500 years or so. In many ways, more powerful than the spoken word, right? Uh, because as you say, the spoken word, you can't transmit through time, right? And it's hard to transmit through space because you have to shout, right? Or you couldn't transmit it through time until podcasting. Yeah. So so podcasting, YouTube videos, the fact that we can record it's audio and video. printing press revolution. Like, this might be a really big deal. This might be a really big deal. Yeah. Right? And you don't know until 100 years later because it's hard to measure the historical impact of things and, until some time has passed, right? Yeah. You know, uh, in another 200 years, people won't even remember the First World War versus the Second World War. They'll just say there was a big war. Right? I mean, I know they'll know the difference, but they'll view them as very connected, right? Um, hypothetically, right? Uh, so it's hard to measure the, the impact of historical things, but no, I agree with you. Like, I th- we might be sitting on a like the something on on par with the Gutenberg Revolution. Yeah, and and wow, that's tremendously exciting. Yeah, I, I was it. I think I heard an argument from Jordan Peterson that mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that makes podcast special is that it's it is cap it has allowed you to use non productive time, say your commute, mm-hmm. productively in a way that has never been possible in human history before. Mm-hmm. Which means suddenly. I mean, the washing machine gave you however many hours of the day back Mm -hmm. that you weren't doing that. And now podcasts and and all the other labor-saving devices did similar things. Now we have all this time that we're sitting on. And now, among other things, podcasts, audiobooks, and uh, we'll talk about Audible later. Yeah. Um, Funny note there. Um, (laughs) Yeah, right. But uh, Now you know why we're doing ads for them. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's it's a significant thing. It it allows you to use that time that has been reclaimed through labor-saving devices Mm -hmm. productively, which means that the the amount of time that people can and do normally spend educating themselves is greater than it has ever been in history, Mm -hmm. and that's a big deal. Yeah, I I mean, who even knows what effects that will have? Right, like you can predict a few, but like it's it's one of those revolutions that might be so large that we have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. And, it, and well, we appreciate you spending some of that yes, revolution well, time you. with us. Right. Viva mean, la revolucion. That, <laughs> that a moment there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, comrades in arms and all that uh, is is what we are really. Um well, okay, so sorry. I, I let us get a little bit distracted, right? You brought up the OODA loop, right, which I think is a great place to start. So the the thing that I think you need to understand about the OODA loop in general thing that I think is most important to understand about it is that John Boyd is prescribing it as as a universal model of purposeful human action and behavior. Right? That's a big deal. So this is yes. the way that all humans always make decisions. Yes. And do you mind if I break down the steps? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so four steps. UDA is the acronym because it's a military thing that has an acronym. <laughs> um, and it's O-O-D-A. Observe, mm-hmm. orient, decide, act. Mm-hmm. And these four steps roughly correspond. So you're paying attention to a situation and saying, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. Second phase is you take all this information that you've been taking in, mm-hmm. and you uh, process that into a map mm-hmm. of what where you are and your relation to the mm-hmm. things going on around yeah. you. You've oriented yourself to the situation. Mm-hmm. You've collected information. Now you've oriented to it. Now that you have this map, you are in a position to make decisions about what you're going to do relative to the other stuff going on now. Mm-hmm. Then you do it. That's the act. Mm-hmm. And then you do it again. The mm-hmm. OODA loop... The reason we call it a loop is because you are constantly doing mm-hmm. this over and over again, and there's some reason to say that in combat, your ability to win is based on how much faster you can do run through the OODA loop mm-hmm. than your opponent, mm-hmm. and how much you can disrupt them from completing the OODA loop. And presumably that's subject to some constraints, and that you actually have to make a good mental map of this situation, you actually do have to be able to physically execute your desired actions, It's not right? just speed. It's not just speed, but it sure seems like speed is a big part of it, and certainly... Um, you know, I mean, imagine imagine playing uh, Settlers of Catan, but uh, every time you go around the board, you get two turns to everyone else's one, right? In other words, you get two decision cycles, right? All of a sudden, you have a really, really, really big advantage. So although I don't think, I mean, obviously speed isn't absolute, but um, but there is something really, really, really powerful there. That if you can move through that cycle more times uh, in the same period of time, uh, this this is starting to give you a huge advantage. Yeah. Right. Um and this is one of the reasons why the OODA loop pops up in, you know, it pops up in military theory, obviously. Um, it also pops up in business thought every now and again. Um, right. Uh, I, again, well, John Boyd would say because it's a universal prescription for human behavior. Well, not only a universal prescription, it's also a universal description. In other words, whether or, like it, whether or not you like it, he says, you're doing this. This is what you're doing when you make decisions. And it's a powerful idea. So mm-hmm. there's this constantly <clears throat> updating mental map that you're carrying around mm-hmm. in your head that says, this is what's going on, and this is what how I am related mm-hmm. to that. 
and that's constantly changing due to the input information. Yes. And also, the, the thing that it's also important to remember is that when you act in the world, you're changing the world, and therefore you're changing the observational data. You know, uh, turn-by-turn games, mm-hmm. like you were describing, yeah. where everybody kind of takes their turn. Board games mm-hmm. are an example of this. Yeah. Um, are, are an example because as everyone has made changes, by the time it gets to your turn again, the the map of what's going on is radically different from the last time you made a turn. Yeah. And so in that case, to make it fair, everybody gets exactly the number, the same number of iterations. Everybody yeah. gets the same number of decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some variance based off of who plays first, right? Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the, the idea that you, you can't hold one map in your head and just project 14 moves in advance and say, this is what I'm going to do on mm-hmm. all 14 moves. I write this program and I mm-hmm. run it, and then I don't pay attention to what's going yeah. on after that. You are paying attention to collecting new information as everyone else continues to affect the board. Mm-hmm. And that changes, which hopefully, is, the way that you choose. Yeah, which is one of the real strengths of the OODA loop is because uh, it is it is not hidebound and stuck in a rut, right? The whole premise of the thing is what works today or what works in this moment is going to be different from what you need in another moment. And so you need a process that updates itself. And that that's the significance of the observation portion of the OODA loop, that mm-hmm. you need to keep your eyes open. Mm-hmm. You, if you are stagnant at any point, you're dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's roughly speaking the prescriptive element of the idea is keep your eyes open. Well, and this is something uh, kind of applying this to, uh, to ordinary life. I think one of the most insanely powerful things you can do uh, in your life is to uh, write down what you're doing, right? Uh, both in advance to plan and then uh, afterwards to reflect. Journaling. Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, like journaling, I think, gets a bad rap or a weird rap because it seems like a very old timey, old fashioned thing to do. And and part of me says, hmm, OK, you cannot move through this loop without creating a mental map. Right. So it might actually really behoove you to make a mental map. And what if you did that every day? What if you were running an OODA loop every day? Right. I, I mean, presumably this could take a number of different forms creating a mental map, right? Like maybe you want to doodle your day instead of writing it down. I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't want to litigate that issue. But my point is like, I mean, this is the hidden virtue of journaling, right? Yeah. Um, is that it? Uh, you're creating a mental map of your day and therefore you're able to figure out what's going on in the world. And then you can move through the OODA loop better and faster. I, uh, I, I have two things to add to that. One, I'm preparing to teach Herodotus, uh, Herodotus's histories next year um, as part of a project that I'm working on. And uh, Herodotus is considered the world's first historian. He, he writes down this history of the things that are going on before him. Mm-hmm. But as far as history goes, it's kind of rubbish. I mean, he's telling its mixture of fact and fiction and myth and all these things. And so you say, well, what's the point of reading Herodotus? He's not mm-hmm. writing good history. <clears throat> Here's the thing that's really significant about reading Herodotus. He's writing history as it was perceived then. Mm-hmm. So maybe it doesn't tell you about 200 years before Herodotus is writing, but it tells you an awful lot about the moment that Herodotus is writing mm-hmm. and about what it's like to see the past the way they saw it right then. Mm-hmm. There's a, a powerful term uh, thrown around in history circles called historiography, which is a study of, uh, this is very meta, <coughs> It's a study of the way that history has changed, the way that we have changed, the way we tell history Mm -hmm. over time. It's a history of histories. And so, you know, Herodotus is writing this mixture of fact and fiction and myth and and stories and rumors and calling it history. Well, that's what he was calling history then. That's what history was. that's interesting to note. And then you go to uh, the 1970s and we idolized the founding fathers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you you get that sense in the the textbooks that they just idolized them. And nowadays there's a a trend to try to uh, say that they were terrible, terrible, and just emphasize the human at the expense of their achievements. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, pushing very much in the wrong direction in my mind. I mean, there's some really impressive stuff that happened then. It's kind of a shame if you missed that Mm -hmm. in favor of talking about, you know, personal foibles and uh, cultural practices that were It's unbalanced in the opposite direction, but it's still unbalanced. Yes, and studying the the history of the way that history has been unbalanced is itself incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, For for one thing, it understands, helps you understand the fact that Mm -hmm. history gets unbalanced, Mm -hmm. which makes you wonder about the history you're being taught right now. Mm -hmm. And that's valuable. Well, so actually this brings us to the prognosmata. One of the um, really interesting things about the prognosmata that absolutely blew my mind um, was the narrative exercise, which is uh, the, the six components, the topoi they're called, 
um, or who, what, when, where, why, how, which is, of course, what we use in journalism today, right? Like, this is the, the six journalistic Ws. H is officially a W, apparently, for how. Um, but whatever. Um, anyway, so, so the question is, or the, the point of this is, okay, if you want to tell a story, here are the six elements you need. Is you need to know what the thing was that happened, and you need to know who did it, and you need to know when and where they did it, and you also need to know why and how they did it. So it's, it's really interesting sometimes. If, if you listen to other people tell stories or describe things, you can stop for a second and, and run through the journalistic, the, those six journalistic questions and ask, okay, what's missing from their story? And is it important? And sometimes you'll find that, uh, you know, uh, people, when they describe events, events in their life, they're, they're describing it without any agent. So who is doing this thing? Well, I don't know. Right. They don't know. Because they don't know who's doing the thing, they can't stop it or prevent it or change it. Right. Um, or, you know, you don't even know what it is that's being done, which goes to the precision of speech exercise, right? Like, if you cannot state what is going on, there's a really, really good chance you don't know what's going on. And the prognosmata is basically preschool for the ancient world. Yeah, I mean, preschool through elementary school. Right? Yeah, well, um, I, I, not, not three-year-olds, yeah, yeah, yeah. not, three but yeah. this is something that you're doing to prepare you to go into the gymnasium, which is the real uh, yeah, school. Yeah, so, so... Grammar school. Yeah. And so the prognosmata is the... Uh, I mean, th this is really basic stuff, and it's been around for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. um, it, let's talk a little bit more ab yeah. about that. So, well, and this this also ties in. One of the things to, to the OODA loop, I'm going to see if I can stitch all these ideas together, because there's like four ideas here that I want to lay out and then stitch together. Prognosmata, historiography, the OODA loop. Uh, Prognosmata, the gymnosmata, and then the OODA loop, right, and why that matters for writing. So the Prognosmata, it's a set of uh, 14 writing exercises. The number changes slightly depending on which ancient author you do. Uh, which ancient author you're reading. Um, but it's a set of roughly 14 exercises. As you said, it's, it's sort of, it's uh, classical, it's preschool and classical antiquity. Runs up through elementary school, maybe even maybe even as far as middle school or high school, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's a set of 14 writing exercises. They range from the very simple. Um, usually the first one is a fable, like Aesop's Fables, that you may have. I actually did have Aesop's Fables read to me as a little kid. I had a whole book full of Aesop's Fables, and I read them all, so... Um, and, and, I, I, and, and the, the exercise is to write one. Yeah, the so exercise you, is to write one. you write a fable, which means you're writing a story mm -hmm. with a moral. Yes. And you need to say explicitly what this story teaches or is uh -huh. about. Yeah. And that, that's a really interesting... So you're abstracting from a Correct. from a narrative to Correct. a principle. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that... So at least I, I actually wrote a paper about this that I presented at, a, at an academic conference that I think the right way to look at the prognosmata is that it is, it is a movement up from the concrete and narrative-based up to the abstract and principle-based, right? And back and, for, back and forth. And ba Yeah, back and forth. So I think that, and I think it's really embodied well in the fable, that the point of the fable is, okay, something happened. What does it mean, right? And you'll notice that, I mean, this is how you run your whole life, right? Is you'll have a conversation with friends or family members or something happens to you at work. And the, the answer is, okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm getting laid off next week? Or does that mean my job is secure, right? You're constantly looking at the events around you and trying to figure out their implications for your actions. You're making, so you're, you're taking in what's happened and you're using that to, A, predict just mm -hmm. no, no judgments, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And second, you, the reason you take in stories is so that you can make decisions. Mm -hmm. and in order to do that, you need to mm -hmm. abstract principles from them to say, okay, when this sort of thing happens, generally speaking, I should do yeah. fill in the blank. Right, and then to be able to reapply those abstract Which principles into new situations. Yes, exactly. It's orienting yourself and learning how to more precisely and more correctly orient yourself to a situation. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Well, and, that, and this is, again, why I think that, like, I mean, I think writing is a very nice, beautiful thing, right? Uh, you know. It's painful. Uh, right? my, my single favorite quote about writing oh. <laughs> is from, um, gosh, I think it's Hemingway. And he said, writing is the simplest thing in the world. You just sit at a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the writing process is, I mean, I don't think it's easy for anyone, right? No. Which no is a thing that non-writers don't understand. No one likes writing. Yeah, and Everyone that, likes having written. And, and that's the thing that non-writers don't understand is that they think the author sit down and, you know, just sort of like produce rainbows and unicorns magically. And, and no, like 
it's it's bleeding, man. And well, and it, that actually helps you a lot because if you have the proper assessment of what your writing episode, you know, your writing exercise, if, if you're writing an essay for school or whatever, if you have a proper assessment of how painful it's going to be, then actually, you know, you experience that pain less, right? And Objectively, you, it's the same, but but your subjective experience of it is less. And if you is overemphasize, less if you overestimate how much pain it's going to be, then maybe you will actually enjoy it. Yeah, you it. can even be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Um. Yeah. People think it, the. Yeah, so I don't think anyone thinks that the writing experience is particularly nice, right? But, like, you know, I don't know. Like, when I think of writing, you know, you think of poetry and you think of the humanities and you think of all these nice, beautiful things, right? And and, and I really think the right way to look at it is maybe that's true. It's but writing work. is a technology. It's something that helps you move through the world. And that's the OODA loop, program not to connection, in a nutshell, right? Like, why do we write? fundamentally to figure out what to do next. Why do we write? Fundamentally to figure out what to do next. Yep. So it's a decision-making aid. Yeah. It's not only a memory aid to remember stuff that's happened before, mm-hmm. but it, it, it helps you to make decisions in so, the future. So well, let's tease out that connection yeah. for how writing affects the future. Uh, yes. So this is the gymnosmata. The pro-gymnosmata are these set of 14 exercises. The gymnosmata, you know, pro-gymnosmata pre-exercises, gymnosmata exercises. Right. Um, the gymnosmata are sort of like the... Incidentally, the, that's where the word gymnasium or yeah. gym comes from. Yeah. Um, are the sort of uh, bread and butter, sort of full-blown uh, exercises uh, in the Renaissance world and in the in classical antiquity for, for rhetoric students. Right. Um, and the, the gymnosmata are divided into three portions. Um, and, uh, well... Aristotle says that the, the three divisions are to write about the past, to write about the present, to write about the future. And the, the, the division is that the past is judicial orations. So you write, what, where do you write situations? Where, where do you write these speeches for? What are they useful for? And the answer is they're useful in the courtroom, they're useful in a deliberative assembly, and they're useful on ceremonial occasions. And in the courtroom, you're trying to figure out what happened. And what it means. Yes. Who's guilty? Who's at blame? Who, who did the thing? Yeah. And in the, in the legislative assembly, you're trying to figure out what to do next, right? In other words, you know, like, should we send an expedition to Sicily? Right? And different people will come forward and speak in favor of and against it. You're trying to project into the future and you're using speech to figure out the future, right? Um, the third one, ceremonial occasions, is uh, Aristotle says it's the present, and I'm not sure I 100% agree with that, but it's a useful way to think about it at least. You're, you're trying to figure out the true nature of things. You're, it's praise and blame, it's figuring out what things are. Praise and blame in the present tense rather than yes. in the past or projecting into yeah, the future. Yeah, although, and this is one of the reasons why I think Aristotle's wrong about that, is because you'll praise people in the past too. But. Uh, the the point is that the the overall point is though that even in a judicial oration and this is one of the insights that I think the Renaissance rhetoric scholars really pulled out is that even when you do this in the present excuse me no even when you do a judicial oration right so you're looking at the past you're in a courtroom trying to figure out what happened right at the scene of the crime or whatever sure um why are you doing that and the answer is you're trying to do that in order to figure out whether or not you should throw this guy in jail yep or where you what should to assign do next him. yeah. Right, yeah. and it, it's the same thing with the with the with the ceremonial orations where you talk about praise and blame and what is worthy and unworthy and good and bad. Is well, why do you care if somebody is a good or bad or something is good or bad? Well, presumably that's going to affect your future decisions. And so, and the, it, again, this is the insight more of the Renaissance scholars that, that I think they built on the, uh, the the Greeks of antiquity is to say, okay, yes, there are these three orations, right? We do speak in the court, we do speak in the legislative assembly. Those are past and future. Right, and we do have these uh, ceremonial speeches of, of um, good and bad, praise and blame, which are maybe present tense, Aristotle says, whatever. Um, but the real point of all of these is all three of these are blended into one master genre, which is what do we do next? Yeah. Understanding where you're at. And that's the OODA loop again. Yeah. Um, you, you're orienting yourself to the past, so you're collecting information constantly. But the information doesn't interpret itself. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a podcast from last week. Yeah. The You have to actively interpret it and use that information to form a picture of the way things are mm-hmm. around you, particularly yeah. about how you're related to them. In other words, pra- praise, blame, uh, intent. These sorts mm-hmm. of things are particularly important. I, I mean, in a combat situation, what is the other guy going to do next? Mm-hmm. Uh, can he shoot me right now? How many seconds until he will be able to shoot me? Mm-hmm. This is these are the sorts of questions you're asking, mm-hmm. and then, based off of that orientation of what's what is going on right now, based off of information you've just taken in from the past, you mm-hmm. then say, "I am going to decide to do this thing in order mm-hmm. to make a change mm-hmm. into the future." 
Well, and it's, yeah, exactly. And it's worth mentioning, like, just a couple of uh, obvious applications of this. When you watch the news or read the newspaper, what's happening is they're helping you build a mental map of the world. And that's going to help you figure out how to vote in the next election, whether or not you're going to invest in this stock or that stock, uh, what you're going to study in school because of the direction the economy is going, uh, you know, whether or not you're going to uh, grab a sign and go protest. Right. Um, and you really want to take in good information mm -hmm. because one of the, the questions when you're orienting yourself to that information is how much of this information can I trust? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things I find fascinating about the news, and this isn't like, uh, th th this, is, this isn't a criticism of any particular news agency. This is just a fact about the way the news is portrayed always, mm -hmm. is it'll be 10%, this is what happened, 90% mm -hmm. extrapolations and guesses about what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. More than half of all the news that I ever watch is speculation, which is completely worthless. After about the first 30 seconds where mm -hmm. I get some good insights, so, oh, they, these are what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's just repetition and it can give you the false sense that you actually do know what's gonna come mm -hmm. next. And so I find that very bare bones news is more valuable for me mm -hmm. because it helps me to separate out this is what we know from mm -hmm. these are all the projections and speculations and guesses about what happened mm -hmm. and why it happened and all these things because I can do that work myself. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, uh, this is another place where I think the journalistic who, what, when, where, why, how is so helpful um, is because, you know, when you're, when you're hearing news, you can like, once you've answered all those six questions, it's like, okay, we're done guys. Right. And anything on top of that, right. When they're projecting into the future, you're like, okay, did that happen? No, that did not happen. You're saying that might happen, which, yep. you know, fair enough. You're allowed to speculate. We're all allowed to speculate. And that's helpful right. for the orientating. Yes. Ori ori orientating. orientating. Oh, gosh. That's a, <laughs> that, that is a dialect uh, thing in, in Utah. That's a funny oh, thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I orientating. Huh. That's a, 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 a gaffe that's very common in the area where I grew up. So, yay. Um, but yeah, the, the, they are effectively trying to orient to the information itself, but you can get locked into that without making decisions. Uh -huh. And without collecting any new information, you're not helping yourself by staying on the second O yeah. past a certain point. Well, and, and there's also, it's, it's worth mentioning, right? Think about a flashbang grenade. Even, you know, raiding a drug lord's house with a flashbang grenade uh, is understandable with the OODA loop, which, which is a testament to how powerful this idea is. And, and to clarify that for, for our listeners, yeah. um, in... So SWAT teams um, and, and various break down the door, jump in, uh, guns blazing police tactics have been developed around this concept of the mm -hmm. OODA loop. And there's two, two sides to this. One, if you're able to go through the OODA loop faster and more effectively than your opponent, then mm -hmm. that's, that's great. And so you can boost your own speed. But another mm -hmm. thing you can do is just disrupt the other guy. Deprive them of information. Deprive them of their ability to meaningfully map their environment and give them Give them incorrect information. Mm -hmm. uh, stun them. These well, sorts of things. And it's worth mentioning, like, if, if, if somebody was attacking you and you broke their arms, like, what you did is you deprived their ability to act, right? Yes. Like, they can be mad at you. They can decide that they want to hurt you, but they actually cannot hurt you because their arms are broken. Sure. Right. Unless they're really good at kicking or whatever. Well, yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Their, their ability you to can, act You can see the principle of the thing. Decreased. Yeah, so these flashbang grenades, right, you, you, you throw them in. I remember hearing from a police officer once that... Uh, you know, typically when they raid people, there will, there will be a gun next to them on the couch, but they don't grab it. The reason why is because, um, you know, first the sense data coming in is disorienting, right? If there's too much in order to orient yes. to the situation to make a decision to grab the gun, exactly. even though technically it's like right there. They can yeah. just grab it. Yeah. Like physically a simple action. But, but mentally. But well, and this is the John Boyd quote, like my favorite John Boyd quote of all time, which is machines don't fight wars. People fight wars wars and they fight them with their minds right your your gun on the couch doesn't do you anything it doesn't, doesn't you help you unless you decided to grab it and exactly, decided to hold it you can it execute and that decision yeah you can you can effectively yeah. aim it and use it which is i mean this is the whole point of like psyops warfare right is you deprive your opponent of the ability to pull in information and then uh understand it and you can sour that information as well in the so the observation phase if you give mm -hmm. them false information then in the orient phase they will orient incorrectly mm -hmm. and yeah. so i mean one of the things that i find most fascinating about world war ii is operation uh paperclip was it i the, uh, paperclip is the germans to the rockets germans to the rockets i think okay yeah yeah that's right no operation paperclip the... is when the u.s uh took a bunch of nazi scientists in order yes. to jumpstart yes. our rocket program. rocket program. No, I'm, I'm thinking of a different one. Um, the, Hitler managed to get a whole bunch of spies into mm -hmm. the UK. 
and you know he's got spies and he's going to try to collect information from the UK in order to uh, continue the war effort and try to conquer the island. Now the British intelligence services, do you want to know how many of those spies that they corrupted to their own ends? Uh, you've, you've told me this story, so I'm going to spoil yeah. it for our viewers. It's 100%, isn't it? 100%. Which is... Every single spy like, on that's, the ground. That's the kind of thing, if I was writing a story, I wouldn't have the guts to write a story you like that. It's too unbelievable. That. It's <laughs> absolutely unbelievable. And so what they did was uh, they, they didn't spoil the, the, the story that they'd gotten all of these. Every single one of them mm-hmm. became double agents. All of them. And some of them were unstable, crazy people who were obsessed with their dogs. And I, this one particular lady, and she started trying to blackmail the British government until they gave her her dog back because it was in quarantine for rabies. Um, yeah, which is a uh, time-honored British custom. But the, the the crazy thing is they would amass all the information. Uh, they had a particular guy who was in charge of the, this double agent program. And his job was to take in the sum total of the information that was available to uh, on, on the ground and, and what they were actually trying to do and then create a parallel believable story mm-hmm. that would misdirect uh, yeah. the Nazis and then distribute pieces of that story to all of these double agents mm-hmm. who would then distribute it back to uh, back to Germany and I mean that is an incredible false but plausible false but plausible and so I the, the which Brit- which is really yeah. sorry I don't mean to interject but uh, I mean that's what novels are right yeah. a good story a good fictional story is false, but plausible. It has yeah. to be believable, which is the weird thing, right? Like The British won the war through literature. You'll, you'll watch movies and be like, well, this isn't believable at all, right? While somebody's like, you know, while Spider-Man's swinging off the walls with webs that come out of his hands, right? And it's like, like what about that is believable? But somehow it is, right? Uh, yeah. It's false, but it's, it's it, it feels real. It feels it integral, whole, and plausible, the, internally consistent, and so forth, right? It, enough of the flavor of truth that they can manage yeah. it. The crazy thing to me about uh, British technology, uh, side note for just a second, yeah. I, while I was a missionary in the Netherlands, I had a chance to visit some really, really cool World War II museums. And whenever I was walking through those, I would walk through the American section where they're showing the American equipment, and I'd say, oh, that's like G.I. Joe stuff. I mean, it's it's rugged, it's designed to fall in the mud, it, it works. Mm-hmm. Great, but nothing terribly special there. And then you go over to the German section, and it's like you're fighting space aliens. Everything is so <laughs> high-tech that it's like you're fighting an alien invasion. It's like, how did you spend the engineering time to develop that thing while fighting a war? Mm-hmm. We don't get it. Yeah. Then you go to the British side, and everything is weird. The bullets are weird. The guns are weird. Everything, you don't know how that could work. And so it's not the weapons that win. Uh, no offense to our British viewers, but uh, <laughs> the, the, or the, well, the I thing mean... that I find fascinating, the reason why they excelled above everyone else was their ability to break codes and control information. Mm -hmm. And they were so unbelievably good at information that, I mean, that that was the edge. That was the edge that allowed them to win the war. Yeah. That's incredible. Machines don't fight wars. People fight wars and they fight them with their minds. Yeah. Yeah. And you you look at blunders, like decision-making blunders. I mean, that's like attacking Russia. I mean, they're they're, they're the Nazis go again. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, actually, I have something I want to say about that, too, but let's take just one brief second and talk about Audible. We've kind of already talked about Audible on this program, so we'll make this super brief. If you do want to help support the channel and uh, check out a free one-month trial of Audible, complete with your own free audiobook that you get to keep even if you cancel your membership. What? Uh, go to audibletrial.com slash goodandbasic um, for that free trial. I mean, we've, we've already kind of spilled the beans on why we like it in this podcast. Because we both use it, and it's incredible. And it's great cosmic significance. Like, this, this, this could be the biggest revolution in information since... Gutenberg. Yeah. yeah. So listening to books. Uh, it's, it's the it, equivalent it's... of a Russian rifle in 1917, 18. When was the Russian Revolution? Uh, it, as, as we were. Wait, as what? We were. Oh, I'm just saying, like, this is this is, this is is the weapon of the revolution. Oh. I'm trying what? to build some revolutionary fervor here. Of, of the revolution, meaning like an information revolution. Yeah. So, yeah, I, okay. I'm actually okay. not okay. a huge... Following the analogy. Yeah, okay, yes. Yep. Uh, uh, please do not brandish guns in public. That's... Uh, yeah. We do not, no. Bad. <laughs> as a general rule um okay well okay well after that awkward segue so there's audible audible trial.com slash good basic um if you're curious in joining that information revolution recapturing all that free time that uh you know lets you learn or even just be entertained right there's plenty of fiction works and so forth yep. um although those although the classical the classical rhetorical curriculum will say no why do we tell stories it's in order to figure out what to do next you it's know, still that what are the most important words a man can say yeah that's a uh, Brandon Sanderson 
quote. Which incidentally is on Audible. So. And it's, 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 that's a good book. <laughs> yeah. um, that's Oathbringer? That's uh, from the, the uh, Way of Kings series? Yeah, the Way of Kings series, yeah. Excellent. Which, Excellent which I books. love, right? Uh, oh, so good. Yeah, Especially that phrase, you must find the most important words a man can say. Ah, okay. Well, so enough about Audible. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, so this is a thing that kind of worries me about the modern world, or that's really interesting in terms of the OODA loop right, is the big problem right now is too much information not getting the right kinds, yeah. right? And so part of your OODA loop is not just pulling in observational data. Part of your OODA loop has to be uh, picking which data you're even going to pick up. Yep, yep, huge right. problem, especially when we're talking about the news. Um, um, one one it, thing that I want to... Do you mind if I just poke yes. on something? One thing that's worth mentioning is that humans actually do do this, right? Like, there's all sorts of things around you right now that are part of your physical environment that you're filtering out because they don't matter, right? They're not a threat and they don't have anything nice for you. Yep, and right. incidentally, that's a huge problem for people who are recording audio because uh, humans are very good at filtering out audio, but yeah. microphones are not. <laughs> and so you need to turn on your ability to hear all the background noise when you're recording, and that's something that I'm still working on. Yeah. Um, as, okay. as you may have inferred. Um, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to. Go, I, I, go I'm right just ahead. looking at how this problem is different over time. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin, in his education, his education consisted of, if he can get access to a book, read the book. Yeah. Very simple line of code. Yeah. All he's doing is, uh, if he, he becomes friends with uh, the apprentice of a bookseller, and he would grab books from this, uh, borrow books from this kid, bring them home, read them at late at night, and just spend every moment of every day collecting information as much as he can, just as much as mm-hmm. he can, because information is rare and precious. If you tried to do that, you would never even get to the end of your uh, Netflix how binge list. It? I can't even remember how many gigabytes of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. It's some, it's, it's some stupid number. It, way more than you'll ever be able to watch, yeah. ever. And yeah. so more than half of what you do is the filtering, and the filtering then becomes incredibly important and because it's important it becomes contentious which parenthetically thank you for letting us through your filter right like that's not thank you so. not not a small thing <laughs> uh the youtube algorithm is an example of this because yeah. we we're starting to get to the point where physically managing the information as an individual as a human is not possible mm-hmm. which means you need technology to help but then the technology any sort of filter that you're imposing is going to include political biases ideological biases relevance biases mm-hmm. and those biases I don't may or get, may not match the, the youtube algorithm does not serve me makeup tutorials and i'm glad for that right you don't use them yeah so that's a place where the filter is operating well yeah right but there's also and i don't know where these videos are but there's videos on youtube that i want to see that i am not seeing and I have no idea how to find them because I don't even know what they are. And I spend a lot of time training the YouTube algorithm on, on the watch later on the uh, recommended page. I will click on all the ones that I'm not interested in and mm-hmm. say not interested to try to teach the algorithm a little bit more yeah. about what I like. But then again, that's creepy because now suddenly the YouTube algorithm knows what I like. Yeah. Um, and that, that's Which a is whole nice, but thing. has its own set of problems. But the, just the characterization of this problem mm-hmm. being separate from the previous problem in the as we're observing and orienting to the world and trying mm-hmm. to amass information, the problem now is too much mm-hmm. rather than not enough. And so whereas before it was drive yourself crazy to collect all the information you can and that's how you get a good education, mm-hmm. a good education now is more about being extremely selective in holding out and displacing the things that you don't mm-hmm. need. Yeah, um, It's about avoiding distraction. And, you know, actually reading something of value or watching something of value instead of watching the cat video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, and I think we're starting to become a little bit more aware of this, right? Like I hear people talking about this, but uh, you know, it's one thing to start to become aware of it. And it's another thing to actually start solving the problem in a meaningful way, right? Um, And, but but awareness is the first step, right? You have to observe first. Um, so observe the problem. We're doing this on a meta level. We are observing yeah. the way that we are observing. Well, and I have a characterization of the problem, so I actually have an orientation about the problem. Okay, so um, now we just need to decide and act. Yeah, well, I'm going to propose the orientation we can argue about and see if it's a good orientation, right? Okay. Um, my belief is that... Uh, so uh, in some circles, um, it's popular to say that the, the answer to the problem with social media and the information revolution and so on and so forth is to uh, is to retract, basically, to pull back, to say, eh, social media fast, pull back, stop stop engaging in media, right? Um, to lessen the flood of information, right? And I think that that's not a good strategy. Really? I don't think it's... I, I mean, I think, it, I think it might have its limited uses, but I think there's a much better strategy, which is you need to build a better filter. You need... 
you need to build a better story to run your life on. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think there's merit to like, you know, let I, each man be the judge of himself. If you're spending too much time on social media or ingesting uh, information uh, on Instagram or Reddit or whatever, you know, that, you know, by all means, cut back, right? Um, but but my answer is I'm but, but what I would agree. say about that. Do, do you mind if I just yes. spell out the idea a little more? I'm saying that for that to be effective, it shouldn't be I am pulling in less information. Instead, the story has to be I am pulling in the right kind and amount of information, and here's why. Yep. That is, I don't think. I I think the answer is to channel the flood, not to hold it back. And I think the attitude of holding back the flood leads to strategic and tactical missteps. And the attitude of channeling the flood, although far more dangerous and difficult, is a much better solution in the long run. I think, in terms of the actual actions that you're taking, those two steps can, th- those two different methods can look very similar. For example, um, I almost never log into Facebook. Mm-hmm. Almost never. Yeah. Uh, and when I do, I, it's almost all solely through the Messenger app mm-hmm. where I'm individually contacting the particular targeted person that I yes. want to communicate with. And then basically I'm using Facebook solely as a um, address book yeah. for keeping track of people. And that, that's Wait, it. Sure, why not? Because right. if I'm reading through the information, um, there's a few filters in place. It, every post that somebody posts has a high likelihood of being the best moments of their lives mm-hmm. and or being the kind of person who is desperate for attention and mm-hmm. just posting everything. Hey. And neither of those help me at all. Mm-hmm. And as much as I love these people, um, I don't <laughs> care enough to spend my time just checking in on how they're doing on all the little updates of their lives. And so I mm-hmm. don't look because I am aware of the type of information I'm likely to find. Unless I'm looking for something specific, I just don't engage with that particular channel. And so Facebook in particular, I, I don't use unless I'm looking for something specific or looking to communicate with a specific person. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a general rule that I use. I'm so... Am I restricting the flow of information? Yes, based off of my um, observation and orientation about what kind of information I'm likely to get there. And it it has no relevance to me. Mm -hmm. Why would I care? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm... When I go on Facebook, I tend to get angry, and that's <laughs> that's an observation that I've made repeatedly and said, well, I don't want to get angry, and so I'm not just I'm just, I'm not going to do it. It's not productive anger, mm-hmm. and so that's an example of that. A lot of news, uh, particularly talking head style news, mm-hmm. is not helpful unless mm-hmm. the thing I'm interested in following is a controversy itself, mm-hmm. and that isn't all that common. And so if I want the the news, I, I get the spoiler. Another example of this, which is kind of terrible, and you feel free to judge me. Um, <laughs> you, you have you, you have been warned. Um, <laughs> I have a dark gift, um, which is that I can quote movies I have never seen before. <laughs> and pop culture is this endless treadmill uh, where you're constantly watching the new movies. And mm-hmm. I used to watch all the movies that came out, just all of them, mm-hmm. and be up to date on what's going on, see all the movies. And then after I got married, my wife and I don't watch a lot of movies. We just don't. I'm too busy making, you know, faces out of kitty litter and all the kinds of crazy projects that I get up to. Making things is something I really mm-hmm. enjoy, and that's productive and useful and, and mm-hmm. self building. Um, But watching movies isn't. And so in order to keep up with my friends, I need enough information about these movies to be able to chat. And so I read the Wikipedia spoilers. It takes me five minutes, way more efficient than the two hours spent in the movie, which may or may not expose me to stuff that I frankly don't want to have to remember. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I know what the movie's about and I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm done. And I've gotten the information I needed. And so for me, the practice of that filter includes not using social media hardly at all. And mm-hmm. not watching movies except for when, after reading the spoiler, I still want to watch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, when you were talking about Facebook, I thought of the fact that this is a very Talebian point, too, where uh, Taleb talks about the news and how if you watch the news every day, the signal to noise ratio is not particularly good. Um, the noise being the stuff that's irrelevant versus yeah. the signal, which is the, the really relevant, juicy, Whereas meaningful stuff. Whereas if you stuff. watch the news once a year, then you're pretty much guaranteed to get the one most important story of the year. Yeah. Right. Well, and this is the problem with 24-hour news, basically, is that... Uh, the, the noise ratio goes up the more yes, frequently you're posting. Because if you have a really big story, um, <clears throat> it can take time, right? But when there's nothing going on, you have to fill it up with something. 
Right, and so you fill it up with some small, uh, not very important story. Or but with each, pure speculation, pure yeah, noise. But each of those will get the same amount of screen time potentially, right? Mm -hmm. Or a comparable amount of screen time. And so as a viewer, it's not always easy to tell what's really important here. Yeah. Right. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think we need to build better filters. And uh, like, there's a lot of complaining right now about biased news. And although I think the complaining is partially warranted, I don't think the solution is unbiased news. I think the solution is just to, uh, to take responsibility for that oneself and to say, okay, I'm going to learn how to interpret the news. I, and I'm going I to learn how to filter the, the facts from the speculation. I have a lot of faith in the, the so the faith there is in the individual to, yeah. to filter out personally what you're going to believe and what you're not going to yeah. believe. And then the, the second part of that is the market, where if there's a lot of people who are honestly mm. interested in finding out what's true, A, they're going to learn the journal, learn how to identify good and bad journalism themselves, mm. learn to recognize those six questions, are they answering these questions, um, and then they'll check maybe with two sources. And then the market will uh, introduce new players that fact check properly. And I mean, you're constantly going to have people building and losing credibility in the market. Mm -hmm. So if the responsibility goes to the level of the individual, it's going to turn out okay. Which, incidentally, this is Isocrates' civic education. You need a bunch of smart, good people making decisions. If you don't have that, your society is in a bad, bad place. Yeah. So. Gosh, this is good stuff. Yeah. We're going to have to talk more about <laughs> uh, civic education, Isocrates, and this rhetoric stuff in the future. But we're basically out of time today. Yeah, pretty much. So, well, good times, guys. Good times. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you for watching. Yes. We're very grateful for uh, your support. If you would like to support us... Uh, with a donation that's available through anchor.fm and we we're deeply appreciative of those yeah, they help we, us to keep the keep the lights on uh, we're glad that you've led us through your filter of good information and yeah. bad information and uh, well we hope that that's true today and tomorrow and for a long time so thanks very much we'll see you next week